God's law has been changed by the power of the sword. But subject and sovereign are clean, different things. By what lawful authority am I brought hither? I failed to spot the wolves in sheep's clothing. Sweethearts, I bid my farewells. I embrace my destruction. A glorious death I should die. And now, you will kill your anointed king. I go from a corruptible to an incorruptible crown. Where no disturbance can be. No disturbance in the world. On the 30th of January, 1649, Charles I, King of England, Scotland and Ireland, walked through this, his banqueting house at the Royal Palace of Whitehall, out of a window and onto a scaffold where his executioner was waiting. Charles had been tried and found guilty, tyrant, traitor, murderer, an enemy of the Commonwealth. But was he guilty? And what led to this unprecedented killing of a king? Charles was never expected to become the King of England. He was second in line to the throne of Scotland. His mother, Anne of Denmark, his father, King James VI of Scotland. Charles was born on the 19th of November in the year 1600, but three years later, his father was invited to become King of England. Charles, however, was left behind as the sickly child. His elder brother, Henry, was bright, strong, and sporting. But at the age of 18, his brother got typhoid fever and died. Charles was now the first in line to the throne. In March 1625, his father died and Charles became king. He was crowned on the 2nd of February, 1626. The most important similarity between Charles and his father James was the belief in what was known as the divine right of kings. There was nobody higher than them and they were not accountable to the laws of common men. Parliament are thoroughly excited by the prospect of a new young king. James had compromised with his ministers. Charles was resolute and would not. Things start to go pretty bad for Charles right from the outset. Charles wishes to marry, to have heirs to continue his line. He arranges a marriage with the Catholic Henrietta Maria of France. However, as a Catholic, his country are not happy about it. Charles is the head of a divided country when it comes to religion. It all started with Henry VIII when he split from the Church of Rome. Now, almost a hundred years later, there is still discontent. There have been many reforms, but with fanatics on either side. Now, Charles is the head of the Protestant Church of England and he has reforms of his own. He wishes for a Protestant state. However, he believes wholeheartedly that there should be a hierarchy within the church and its ministers and a deference towards them. For Puritans, that is too much like Catholicism. Perhaps Henrietta Maria is bringing too much influence to our Protestant king. She is known as the Popish Brat of France. Charles will not put up with this. 
In the first four years of his reign, he disbands Parliament three times, up until 1629, when this time he would disband them for what turned out to be 11 years. Charles was a loving husband and a doting father. It is known that Charles loved to play with his children at St. James's Park, where they would play outside. He also had a silver staff where he would score upon it to see the changing in height. He referred to his queen, Henrietta Maria, as his dear heart. After 11 years of ruling on his own, Charles is out of money. His foreign wars have cost a fortune, and now the only thing to do is to recall Parliament. However, straight away, they have disagreements once again. Parliament is divided. Those who are on the side of the king, royalists. The others who support Parliament are known as parliamentarians. These arguments continue back and forth until eventually there is no other path to take. The King, on the 22nd of August, 1642, raises his banner at Nottingham Castle. Civil war has started. God save the King, they cry. Civil war in England is the bloodiest conflict that will ever take place on English soil. It will last five years and it is estimated that over 200,000 people will die. Charles is doing very well for the first two years, and the Royalists seem to take every single victory. However, that all changes in 1644. Oliver Cromwell makes his name. And at the Battle of Naseby, the King's forces are beaten. It goes from bad to worse, however, for our King, and eventually Parliament sign an agreement with the Scots, and they join the war on the Parliamentarian side. Charles tries to negotiate with them as well, however, is taken prisoner. He is then handed from one house to another until eventually being locked up at his own palace of Hampton Court. Then word reaches the king there might be an assassination attempt. So, in 1647, he tries a daring escape and he manages it. Unfortunately, he is once again recaptured and eventually brought back to London. Now there is talk of placing a king on trial. The country once again is divided. Who could place a king on trial? With the divine right of kings, he's above the law. It's a hugely unpopular decision to place a king on trial. The majority still wish to negotiate with him. However, when they arrive to Parliament in December 1648, they find that there are soldiers on the door. Those who will not look favorably upon the king's trial are turned away. Many of them are arrested. Those who are allowed to enter will become known as the Rump Parliament. These remaining 46 MPs take a vote. A majority of 26 decide to place the king on trial. On the 20th of January, 1649, the trial began. Charles dressed for the occasion. He wore a fine black velvet suit with a black hat, a white lace collar around his neck, and, of course, the blue ribbon with the jeweled George upon it, signifying that he was the head of the Order of the Garter. He kept his hat upon his head, showing that everyone else should show deference to him. When the court begins their questioning, Charles stops them and demands, by what power am I called hither? For three days, Charles refuses to recognize the authority of this court and will not enter a plea. Despite this, the trial continues. On the morning of the 27th of January, Charles was brought to Parliament to have judgment passed upon him. He had been found guilty. He tried to speak a word, but was silenced by John Bradshaw, the head of the proceedings. He insisted, will you not hear a word, sir? But he was denied. He was led from the courtroom. For Charles, it was all too late.
Charles is given three days to prepare for his execution. He asks that he might be allowed to see his youngest children still in the country, Elizabeth and Henry. He then writes a letter to Charles, his eldest, advising him on what to do when he becomes king. He writes to James, telling him to stand by his brother. On the 29th of January, Henry and Elizabeth are brought to meet their father. Elizabeth is hysterical with tears. Charles comforts them as best he can. He tells Elizabeth she will forget this. Henry is sat upon his father's lap and Charles says to him, at no cost should he accept the crown. Parliament may try to give it to him. Henry insists he'll be torn apart before he accepts. When it is time for them to leave, Elizabeth is distraught. Her father rushes to the door and embraces them one last time. They are then ushered out the door. Charles collapses in a heap upon the floor. He spends the rest of the day in his bed, inconsolable. On the night before his execution, Charles got about four hours sleep. He arose two hours before dawn, but with the sunrise, he opened the curtains and said, I have great work to do today. He called for his attendant to bring him an extra shirt, for it was a cold, icy day outside. He wouldn't want anyone in the crowd thinking he shivered out of fear. At 10 o'clock, there was a sharp knock upon the door. It was time. He would be escorted from St. James's Palace through the park under armed guard. At 2 p.m., Charles was led through this hall. The cruel irony being that he walked underneath the paintings he commissioned by Peter Paul Rubens, showing his father looking down from heaven and the nature of the divine right of kings a belief which had brought Charles to this very moment. He passed through the hall. And out onto the scaffold. If Charles felt any nerves at this moment, he hid them well. He conducted himself with strength and decorum. This was such an unpopular decision to execute a king. The new model army had been posted to hold the crowd back. To find an executioner to kill a king was a hard task. Whoever they found did not want to be recognised. So they dressed in the outfit of a sailor, wore a false beard and a wig, and placed fishnets over their head. Charles noted that his last words would only fall upon the ears of his executioners and the soldiers around him. He said, I go from a corruptible to an incorruptible crown where no disturbance can be. He asked his executioner if his hair was troubling him. His executioner said yes, and so Charles placed a nightcap upon his head. His executioner helped to tuck the hair away. He told his executioner that he would say his last prayers, and when he stretched out his arms, he was ready to die. Charles lay himself down upon the floor. He said his last prayers, stretched out his arms, the axe fell. His unwavering commitment to the divine right blinded Charles to the need for compromise. He was a man who stuck to his beliefs, but ultimately paid for it with his life. Was Charles solely to blame? Or were he and Parliament on a road that led to only one outcome? What do you think? <laughs>